also for keeping the time uh, so that we have now uh, some time for the panel debate, which is the next point on our agenda. And um, just as a small background for you, um, when you uh, when you registered for the workshop before Monday, you could submit questions um, to be answered. And um, this is what we have now. Um, I'm briefly introducing the panelists to you. This is Guy Pierre from IDIF and U of Z. We have Alan Matthews, Trinity College, Ireland. We have Mike McKenzie, DG Agriculture Unit Pers Policy Perspectives and Maria Fuentes, also DG Agriculture, Greening, Cross Compliance and POSAI. But before we are opening and um, putting the questions to you, um, I'm inviting Lukas Wyszek, Cabinet Member, Office of the Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans to introduce the panel discussion. Lukas, please go ahead. Thanks very much and, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, I will be extremely brief. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has undertaken this mammoth project in uh, in all member states. Uh, I think that you know it it shows it shows two uh, really important things. One is that the cap and the cap strategic plans have to be driven by evidence. It's not just a political decision uh, of uh, the agricultural ministries. This has now become a much bigger project. And that brings me to the second thing, which is that. Uh, what you have done also not, not just with the reports but also with the with the workshops in member states uh, is uh, leading to a much closer public scrutiny of the common agricultural policy and of course of the uh, of the cup strategic plans and i think that this is really crucial in order to make uh, the common agricultural policy a, a true green deal uh, policy now um, as i said the you know, it's it's the evidence that is that is that is crucial in designing the policy, but uh, but also in the in the cup strategic plans, which is going to be the next milestone in the process. Uh, and and I want to emphasize that you know, this has to be a process which is very inclusive, which has to be based on evidence. The Commission uh, put forward recommendations uh, to to member states in uh, December, uh, which map situations in in every in every member state, uh, so that it is easier to actually base. Uh, the the programs on the on the real needs which are backed by uh, by data and and by the findings and of course again uh, your contribution to this is is extremely is extremely valuable and uh, uh, and appreciated I do have the honor to ask the first question uh, to to the panelists so thank you very much for that my question is So clearly, there's no one size fits all. But I'll try to ask that anyway. Uh, what, in your view, would be the key principle that member states have to take into account in designing their CAP strategic plans, so that the CAP strategic plans and the CAP itself has the biggest fighting chance to address the two crises, the, the, the two crises that we're facing: the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Thanks very much and, uh, uh, and all the best for the rest of the panel in the workshop. Thank you. Lucas, thank you very much for the opening words. And um, I would like to have the ladies first principle. Maria, do you want to give your life-saving um, recommendation? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, many. I have uh, written in, in the chat that um, I found um, uh, pretty all the recommendations very useful. Um, I already uh, read the, the report some months ago. Um, just to um, just to say one, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, the need to focus on 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 landscape features and non-productive areas and on, on grasslands, for instance, just to, to tell one. Maria, thank you so much. And I pass over to Mike, complimentary from DG Agri. Yes, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. So looking at the recommendations in the report, I would also say, you know, I mean, very important to place greater emphasis on landscape features and semi-natural areas. I think saying to put them at the center of the green architecture might be a little bit strong, uh, but certainly we need to pay more attention to those. And there is a great deal we can do uh, through the cap 
as proposed for the future. Really, if you look at the range of obligations proposed through conditionality and then the sheer range of tools, there's a great deal that we can do. We need to do it. And a further little principle for making sure that happens is really to use the full flexibility of the future cap toolbox. However, it exactly turns out it will be flexible. There will be great possibilities. We need to make the most of those. Thank you. All right, Mike, thank you very much. And I pass over to Alan. What's your key recommendation if you have to pick one? Well, I suppose, uh, Jenny, uh, coming from Ireland, I'm going to pick the point that was made by John and others uh, about the importance of the land eligibility rules uh, and the need to amend these to ensure that all land that uh, contributes to the objectives of the cap, which include uh, environmental and climate objectives, uh, should be valued uh, and farmers should get uh, recognition uh, for it. Uh, there was a point raised in the in the chat uh, whether member states will have uh, uh, um, the powers to do this, and indeed, um, as I understand it, member states uh, will define eligible hectares uh, in their strategic plans. But of course, they will do so uh, within the constraints and the the rules set out in the basic legislation, and uh, that's one of the issues that still remains to be decided in the super trialogues. Okay, Alan, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, Guy, do you want to have your pick on the rec one recommendation? Yes, thank you. So thank you, Lucas, for this question. I had to think a lot about that. And my answer is that there's one recommendation which is written on the report, in the report, and in the essence of the report itself. And this is to use science and to involve scientists. We need to place those aspects that work and exclude those that don't work. That will make things much simpler and make it easier to explain to the public how cup money is being spent. One needs to involve the scientists and make things simply work. It sounds so simple, but in a way, there are many relevant expertise in each and every one of the member states, and all of them have expressed the willingness to support and to help, and they provide valuable knowledge. Now, I should remind everyone that we're not talking about ecologists. There are many economists participating. There are politician, political scientists, social scientists, and encompassing all of these disciplines is really important because the cup is, first of all, a policy. And it looks the way it looks for a range of reasons. So the issue is to allow the scientific community to help finding the win-wins, to address the trade-offs, and to moderate those places where there are conflicts. Scientists are not stakeholders. They're a natural partner, in a way, for addressing crisis, as we see now with other crises like COVID-19, climate, and others. Scientists are going forefront because they do have a lot of knowledge to contribute. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Um, I hope, Lucas, you got some answers that you were looking for. Um, the four best picks, um, different perspectives. Very good, thank you very much. And um, now, again, just to repeat, um, on when you registered until Monday, you had the chance to submit questions and uh, we picked the questions that were most broad and um, made a compilation so that um, each question that we are raising here is answered um, either by Mike and Maria from the DG Agri or from uh, the scientific perspective, Guy and Ellen, uh, or Ellen. And um, well, I put the most, the longest and perhaps maybe um, very good question first. Um, it was raised by Anna Teresa Silva from the Cabinet for Planning Policy and Administration by the Ministry of Agriculture of Portugal. And um, she actually asked three questions in one, uh, and that, but very key questions that all to do with how to recon reconcile biodiversity protection. The first with um, reducing administrative and financial efforts in monitoring and controlling support schemes. The second is how to reconcile biodiversity protection to reduce land use conflicts with agricultural and livestock production. And the third is still how to reconcile biodiversity and protection and still provide or guarantee food supply. So um, how to, yeah, everything, put, putting everything under that one hat, still look at watching out for biodiversity and um, Guy, I'm putting it back to you to, um, to give a first step on answering these three questions. Go ahead. 
Okay, so first of all, this is a complex question. We have three sub questions. I'll try to address each of these three because they're very important actually. So first of all, regarding administration, um, this is indeed a major problem. It's not directly related to biodiversity, but one uh, recommendation among many tips that were given by member states uh, workshop was, for instance, to move from farmers needing to submit many applications towards a whole farm application. That will save a lot of work uh, for farmers needing to start filling on forms for many different uh, parts of their field for different instruments. And it also allows us to look at the farm as a whole and not just uh, pieces that one needs to put together. Um, also by operating on the landscape level and supporting collaboration and in, in local initiatives can make things a bit easier. Of course, there's no magical solution to administrative uh, burdens. The issue of land use conflicts relating to livestock is actually a complicated issue because you cannot resolve these problems by looking only at production. You have to look at production and consumption. It's obvious that we need to extensify land uses. We need to reduce the number of animals on grasslands because this is one of the major causes uh, for uh, biodiversity losses, reduction of uh, nutrient levels and pollution that is necessary. Um, and of course, it also relates to imports of feedstock from outside driving deforestation in, in the Amazon and other places. But if we extensify uh, grazing land use only in Europe, that would mean that we're actually uh, exporting our problems to other parts of the world if we are still continuing uh, to consume the same amounts of, of meat and dairy products. So we have to link that also uh, to consumption behavior. And this is where the farm to fork is extremely relevant in looking at the whole system uh, and finding a solution that will meet also biodiversity and climate. Now, the most uh, important and maybe the hot potato of this discussion is this the question of food supplies. And I think there's a misconception regarding biodiversity protection and, and production. In fact, biodiversity is not just not impeding production, but the opposite is true. The real threats for food supplies come from environmental pressures. They come from soil degradation, from droughts, uh, and we cannot produce on a barren land. And this is the key issue. So protection of landscape features should be perceived as maintaining soil, water, helps regulating climate uh, and mitigating drought effects. It, it gives a host for pollinators. So it might be very tempting to think, okay, if we remove the remaining 5% nature, we make five more percent uh, profit, uh, but this doesn't work like that because we lose ending up, um, we, we end up losing the entire production uh, by drought or something else. We need to look at it as an insurance for production, in fact. Um, and we need to shift our mindset, realizing that protected biodiversity is one of the means to ensure food supplies rather than a conflict. And if and where there is a trade-off, then it's the cap role to simply pay for these local small losses. Thank you. Okay, all right. Guy, thank you. Um, Mike, the from your perspective, is that something that you can share or having a, yes, I, a different I, angle? I, I can certainly add and I'll, I'll try to compliment. Uh, though I would say if this is all under one hat, as you said, Jenny, it's a very big hat, uh, maybe a sombrero. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to disappear totally under it. Um, first of all, with regard to the, the aspects of administration and checking, so we should be aware that we've made big strides forward in the approaches and techniques that can be applied, and some member states are already applying them to some extent. So here we're talking about the information that can come from satellites, including the Copernicus Sentinel satellites and also other Earth observation data, as well as what farmers can just do with their smartphones, taking pictures themselves to provide evidence. Um, so approaches involving these elements can reduce the extent to which we have to carry out detailed spot checks regarding whether farmers are meeting uh, eligibility conditions for receiving various types of payments. So just a crude example, um, it can remove the need for inspectors to go and measure fields, um, things like that. We can also arrange now for farmers to get automatic reminders uh, about certain obligations. Uh, for example, if they still have to mow uh, in a given field, if a satellite shows that they haven't done so already, and we're working on greater automation of, of claims for CAP support. There's a lot we can do there. We need wider uptake. Uh, we haven't solved all our problems. And of course, with biodiversity, some monitoring will be complex, but if we can reduce the overall burden, then we can focus our efforts more uh, on areas that do still need quite a bit of uh, human input. Um, with regard to conflicts between biodiversity and, and livestock, so we should bear in mind, there's not always a conflict. Uh, it depends on the area. So of course, in some areas, 
Uh, we need livestock there to give us the biodiversity, so in extensively farmed grassland, but we need to find a way to make that pay and in some cases, of course, reduce tensions. So where problems um, from, from livestock farming arise with regards to biodiversity from manure, for example, we need better manure management, in fact, better nutrient management more generally. To some extent, we can take advantage of opportunities with biogas, so that needs quite a lot of investment. So all kinds of cap support can be relevant for that. Um, also, where we have more intensive production, we can use extensification, premia, that will no doubt continue, potentially in, in both pillars of the cap. And in the more extensive areas, again, to, to keep things going, we can use, well, of course, income support, uh, payments for areas facing natural constraints, et cetera. So there's a lot, a lot we can do that. On the food side, um, more generally, I shan't comment in detail on the issue of diets, because uh, the commission is not laying down the law about this. But of course, this guy says it is mentioned in the farm to fork strategy. Um, but again, I think what we can do there, it, it's, we're talking about adequate provision of food on the one hand and environmental public goods on the other hand. And various things that we can do to keep food production efficient can also be beneficial for, for biodiversity. So again, in terms of, for example, our use of nutrients and pesticides, we can find ways of reducing the pressure on biodiversity from those, but without uh, lowering fruit, food production. And I've just had a weird technical message come up on my screen, excuse me, which I'll try to get rid of. Uh, I'm being having it suggested to me that I should reboot my computer immediately, which I'm certainly not going to do. Um, right, that's put me off my stride a little bit. Perhaps that's a good thing because we have limited time. So I'll, I'll leave my comments on that question there. Thank you. Okay, Mike, thank you very much. I hope that was no um, secret measure to stop you saying what you said. Um, finding the middle ground, finding things that are co-beneficial. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that much more can be said about that three sub questions, no doubt about it, but um, I would like to like switch focus and raise another question that was submitted to us by Andrea Beste Institute for Soil Conservation and Sustainable Agriculture, gesundeerde.net. And the question is, how can it be ensured that the light green measures in pillar one are not remunerated at a higher rate than the organic farming in pillar two, which might be even more beneficial than those in pillar one. All right, and um, I would like to direct this question to Maria. Please go ahead. Hello, can you please, can you, okay, I put this, uh, um, I will be really very, very, uh, very short and, and, and direct on this and, um, and say that um, we, we have been uh, really working, the, the, all the three institutions in Article 28 about eco schemes since November. Um, so we had to have a, a lot of discussions, uh, very intensive, a lot of drafting. And uh, I have to say that um, the changes made will really ensure uh, a link between the, the, the premier and the level of ambition of the commitments including in the in the eco schemes, particularly for for incentive uh, for the top up uh, payments, because of course for the compensatory payments is is more straightforward as we have a calculation uh, method which is quite objective. Um, so there will be a, a provision. You will this is on, on the on the press. I won't read it, but um, uh, I think it, it it will be public in any case uh, next week, I suppose. So there will be a provision uh, that will allow the, the commission to check in the cap plan the link uh, between the level of ambition and the level of the payment of each eco schemes. Uh, so as one of the presenters uh, said, we will have a, a reference uh, for the incentive payments um, uh, with this link with environmental benefits. But obviously, um, I mean, this is not a, a mathematical uh, demonstration. This is not a logarithm, it's not an algorithm, and, um, and but uh, we will be able to, to carry out a, at least a plausibility assessment and to guarantee a certain coherence. But 
I have to say also that these, uh, obviously nobody uh, put into question the benefits of organic farming. And we also know uh, what are um, uh, light or dark green measures. But uh, these also can be different in different contexts. Uh, and so what we can think is a light measure, uh, for instance, crop diversification in today's greening, um, while this can be considered um, very light green and not very demanding in, in, in certain um, territories with already a very crop, uh, uh, a high crop diversity, might be very demanding in other territories in which uh, really uh, wheat and mice dominated really the, the the, the, the farmland. So, um, and just I cannot really uh, not to say something on the land eligibility issue because obviously this is a, a key point. Uh, so, uh, this is a point on for the trilogue, but really there is a political will in all the institutions to really extend the eligibility um, to uh, to at least agroecological elements. But obviously it's a question of balance. I mean, we cannot uh, extend the eligibility to direct payments and to eco schemes because agro-environmental commitments is much more, um, uh, so this is a different issue, but we, we cannot extend to all uh, valuable um, uh, landscape or habitat in, in, in Europe, uh, but uh, there is a, a political will really to, to, to go further on, on, on this and, 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 and it's really a question of, of, of drafting. Uh. Maria, thank you very much also for letting us know that you're working on this. Perhaps not a final solution there, but discussions are there and it's on the agenda. Very good to know. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to move to the next question by Andrea Perino from IDEF. What are the concrete steps that the EU can take to improve the effectiveness of the CUP post 2020? So it's an effectiveness measure and um, those usually go to the economists. Alan Matthews, please go ahead. We don't hear you. Have, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I, I, uh, I just had to remember to unmute myself. Uh, this is a great question, Jenny, but it's obviously a huge one. We could spend a, a whole webinar uh, talking about this. But maybe just a couple of comments. First of all, uh, it's clear that we need uh, to get the legislative uh, framework as ambitious as possible. And, and clearly, there's still time between now and next week to uh, try to indicate both to ministries and to the parliamentary uh, rapporteurs um, the need to hold the line on some of the, the issues. Uh, the land eligibility issue, Maria has, has highlighted that. Uh, the question of um, the mandatory elements in the enhanced uh, conditionality, uh, the extent of ring fencing, uh, both in pillar one and in pillar two for uh, environmental uh, and, and climate measures. Uh, so, uh, you know, getting the, the, the legislative framework as good as possible. It, it has been diluted, uh, I think, quite a lot from what the Commission proposed originally, but there's still, I think, some potential to, uh, to pull back on, on, on some of those issues. Secondly, uh, and it was mentioned, I think, by, by Mike and others, uh, uh, the, the focus will now shift increasingly to the design of the, the national strategic plans uh, at member state level. Um, and strategic planning is a hugely difficult task um, and it's going to require uh, a real change in mindset uh, in um, national ministries to move from this sort of compliance uh, uh, mindset to the performance and, and output and outcome based uh, mindset. So um, uh, member states, I think, will need a lot of help. Um, uh, hopefully there will be a lot of mutual learning between uh, member states over the next 12 months as these plans are, are, are finally drafted. Uh, there needs to be wide participation. We need to ensure that uh, uh, environmental and climate groups, you know, are able to participate and have their voices heard uh, in the drafting of, of, of these measures. And then the third element, just briefly, that I think is important is, of course, the governance. Uh, and, and this has two elements. Uh, one is the commission approval process. Um, 
and uh, Herve has already uh, mentioned in his uh, contribution uh, the importance of trying to ensure that uh, strategic plans address uh, the Green Deal uh, objectives and, and, and show that they have done so. Um, but also, the, 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 once the plans are approved, then of course we do need to monitor and make sure that they are implemented. So there's a whole range of issues that I think are uh, covered by, by this question and a whole uh, range of, of levers, if you like, that we can use to ensure that the next cap is indeed more effective, uh, not just for biodiversity, but for the other objectives as well. Alan, thank you very much for your perspective and giving us an insight into the three most important points. Um, and perhaps, Mike, you want to complement or maybe you have very different perspectives. Go ahead. I wouldn't say very different. I'll, I'll just focus on one or two further points, maybe. And, and one which may be quite obvious, but needs to be mentioned. So, And I'll focus on implementation here. When the trilogues are finished, we all need to understand the result <laughs> and understand the toolbox which has emerged may sound obvious, but it's not always so obvious. And you see that during the political discussion. So we'll have to have a clear common understanding of what can be done because that's the foundation for, for doing good things with it basically. And then, as I said earlier, that will enable member states to use the flexibility available uh, involving other parties in, in helping that, of course, but really doing things in different ways in different member states according to, to what will work. And in doing that, we all need to draw on experiences of what has worked well in the past. Um, there is a vast amount of knowledge out there, a vast amount of research which has been done, is being done, but it's not always used and it's not always communicated to those who need it. That has to happen and that knowledge has to be adapted to local circumstances, uh, including, for example, through the European Innovation Partnership for Agricultural Productivity and Sustainability. And then finally, we need to be ready politically and practically for the notion that not everything in CAP plans will work well initially. Some things will have to be changed. So we've mentioned a lot about monitoring here that will have to happen but we need to be politically ready for the notion that it's not a bad thing to have to change it doesn't necessarily mean failure uh, it means you're, you're trying some things out some things need to need to be a, a little bit modified we do that in order to get uh, better results thank you all right brief answer very good thank you mike um and again we have to change uh, topics um more or less yeah, completely, but still very broad question that was brought to by James Moran Galway, Mayo Institute of Technology. What safeguards can we put in place to ensure eco schemes don't repeat the mistakes of greening in the previous common agricultural policy? And um, yeah, Maria, maybe I can hand over the first, first word to you. Um. Well, when I read this question, um, I, I was really thinking, and, and finally, um, I'm not sure that the right uh, issue is about putting uh, safe wars. Uh, so, um, because uh, eco schemes are fundamentally uh, and totally different from today's uh, green payment, and, and uh, so. Uh, that the commissioner uh, mentioned in his speech uh, some key elements that make really the difference, uh, but these are just some. I mean, the, the results-based approach, the reinforced system of conditionality, because um, uh, the, 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 what we, uh, the, the GAEC that we, we, we have planned and that we are quite confident to, to achieve includes all the current greening measures and go uh, even beyond. So um, obviously uh, how much the conditionality will, 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 will go uh, further will depend uh, uh, on, on, on the discussions next week, particularly as you you know, for the landscape or the share of now landscape features and also for the crop rotation. But in any case, I have learned uh, already from the report and today that if we have crop diversity is not so bad. So, um, so in any case, what I can say is that the commissioner is really uh, pushing really very hard um, for, for, uh, for, for the remaining points for a share of non-productive areas and 
features for biodiversity. We are confident that we are going to have agaic without productive elements. So this is, uh, we are can quite confident. And, um, and, and so uh, we, we are also quite confident that the final legal text for, for eco schemes will really ensure a good balance between flexibility and, and ambition. And I have also to say something that um, I didn't invent myself, but is uh, something that I read from, uh, from a Professor Matthews. So, and is that the effectiveness of the, of the measures depend on the eco schemes, finally will depend on three factors. So uh, I'm copying you now, uh, is the, 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 the effectiveness of the practice per se, and this can be very variable uh, according to the, to the regions and the territories, and this is why we are doing flexibility. The second, if the level of implementation, so the scale uh, to, to, to reach a, a critical mass, and the third is the level of the payment and the failure of the greening, and I fully share uh, Professor Matthew's assessment, is the, the main failure, if we can say failure, I mean, the, the, the the low performance of, of the of the greening is not because the practice were bad um, uh, per se, the crop diversity or, or, or the protection of permanent pastures or, is uh, because maybe the the, the 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 implementation level was not adequate because some of these practices were already mainstream in in, 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 in parts of Europe and also because of the um, level of, of adequacy of the payment. And for these, so uh, I refer to my previous um, to my previous uh, reply. So, uh. Maria, thank you very much. And I like that we are already maybe following the first idea of scientists and policy working closely together. Thank you very much for that. And um, Guy, do you want to have a stab on this question as well? Yes, please. I'm excited by this discussion, uh, partly because uh, there are diverging opinions, and that's uh, very valuable, uh, but also because stepping a moment backwards, I'm realizing some of the participants maybe in this meeting are not CAP freaks or CAP experts. So we need to remind those that are not feeling themselves comfortable that greening was not maintained. It was not maintained because it doesn't work to put compulsory measures that everybody's opposing. So it was changed to different perception of a voluntary approach. And in fact, the greening elements moved into conditionality and only some greening elements might or may not come into uh, the eco schemes. Uh, particularly, we don't know what will happen to diversification, which was anyway diluted completely. Um, but the easiest way to avoid the mistakes of greening is to decide not to do it. The failure of, this, uh, of greening was a failure by design. It was a decisive uh, action that took during the negotiation processes in the trilogue. Uh, it was done by exemptions, by reducing the requirements and diluting uh, the baselines so that there was no need to do anything. 90-90% of the farmers could meet greening without doing anything. Um, and that was a failure by design. And this is what we want to avoid. But this means that conditionality should cover not only arable land, but also grasslands and permanent crops, including olive groves, wine and apples. I mean, there's so much potential to uh, protect biodiversity in such heterogeneous environments, and, and it's not that difficult even. Um, we should have avoid removing all the small farmers uh, and, and remove eligibility barriers for far other farmers, like uh, for on eco schemes, land users that cannot apply for them, or, or payments for forest holders that only the forestry sector can apply. That can be dangerous. Um, we should just make sure that uh, production oriented crops like um, nitrogen fixing crops, uh, catch crops, etc., they have a value in themselves, a value for soil protection, etc., then put them in GAIC 7 and 8 where they belong, instead of starting to play with the question of whether to pay or not to pay. This is good practice, but it doesn't relate to either GAIC 9 or to be paid for through eco schemes, because then we simply lose the money for doing something which needs to be done. Um, and then, of course, the most important issue was to set the targets and baseline correct. And this is what we've already spoken about. And you've heard that enough. Uh, the no dilution and no backsliding principles need to be systematically checked by the commission before they approve the strategic plans. And if they see that this is not ambitious and even sets targets beyond or sorry, below current levels of what there is in member states, then they should uh, be sent back for revision before approval. 
Um, and all in all, greening was not working because science was again, it was ignored, it was not used. Um, so use the science, it's not very complicated. And I think this is where greening, uh, we can move away from greening and into something that works. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And just in time, very good. I would like to thank very much Sky Pair from IDEF UFZ, Alan Matthews, Trinity College, Ireland, Mike McKenzie, DG Agri, Policy Perspectives, and Maria Fuentes, DG Agri, Greening, Cross Compliance, and POSI for, um, yeah, for taking these questions, for giving honest answers yeah for, for also showing complementary maybe even contradicting perspectives um yeah very good thank you so much and um for now i think we have almost all but um the question remains so what what happens next what what's what what now what what do we do and um there we have the great pleasure um for a closing statement by pierre bascou director sustainability and income support also from dg agriculture mr bascou please over to you thank you very much jennifer and um good afternoon to everybody ladies and gentlemen uh, first of all i would like to say that i'm very pleased i think to have the opportunity to say some closing words at this workshop um i would like also to apologize because i was not able to, to take part i think in the whole event this afternoon but I did attend, I think, the beginning, and I'm just uh, being able to attend, I think, the, uh, uh, the panel discussion, uh, listening a lot to uh, um, people that I know very well, uh, Alan, etc., and uh, listening about, you know, um, element and policy instruments like greening that we have been working on and we continue to work on with, you know, uh, for quite a while. So I think it was, uh, this was very, uh, very interesting. At this workshop, we have been drawing partly I think on lessons I think from the past to give us momentum into the future and there I would like to focus on now on the future and what are our next you know key steps I think for the commission and I would like for that I think to start first I think with the trilogues as you know I think right now I think the trilogue discussion on the CAP reform are in the white heat I think of the final phase I think as some sportsmen say I think we're entering into the uh, into the money time and uh, as you know, I think there's still you know, lively debate about various important aspects I think, of the proposed reform. And the Commission is pushing hard, is pushing very hard, I think, to get a good result out of this discussion, discussion which has lasted almost three years since I think we adopted this proposal on the 1st of June, I think, 2018. But we can already be very confident that the final reform will have at least certain key features and all of which can be benefits in terms of biodiversity. First, member states will be planning the use of both pillars of the CAP together against clear objective, and in particular, including the uh, objective of biodiversity, and this in a strategic manner. And I would like to underline, I think, the word of strategic. This is extremely important. We were talking about greening before, failure by design. We may agree or disagree, but I think what was missing was that the strategic element, I think, of greening and the, and the capacity of greening to address, I think, specific uh, hot environmental hotspots. Second, I think we, uh, we will have a wide range of tools that will be available to address, I think, these, uh, these objectives. Among these tools, there will be, I think, the eco schemes, which is a very important novelty and one of the focal points, I think, of the report being presented today. And from what I heard, I think, you know, which have been uh, discussed, I think, in the, in the panel debate. But we shouldn't also forget conditionality that will play an essential role, as well as, I think, the various tools available in the second pillar of the CAP. Third, in comparison to the current situation, member states will have greater overall flexibility to use and tailor the tools together in ways that work for them in order to achieve, I think, the CAP objectives. And this is where, as compared to the, for instance, the greening policy instrument, they will be, I think, much more tailor-made, you know, policy support to the farmers in order to improve, I think, the environmental and, and climate performance. And I understand that this flexibility um, makes some people, you know, nervous. I think raise, I think has raised, I think, some concerns. I think in certain uh, um, in certain circles, but I think for us, I think we see that I think as you know, providing you know, real potential to improve, I think, the performance of the CAP in particular in terms of environment and climate delivery. 
and forth. And although there have been you know, intense debates on the details of the future indicators, they will be monitoring of CAP strategic plan. They will be evaluation. And there will be adjustment of the plans. You can already refer to that. Some aspects will work. Some others will work a bit less, and they will need to be adjusted. So there will be, I think, some uh, some possibility and some need, I think, for adjustment. I think as the strategic plan are put in place in the future. So this is for the trial. So starting from that foundation, what do we need to do in order to get good results, in particular with regard to biodiversity as well as with regard to the other objectives? And there, I will start talking about the uh, the member states. I think perspective from member states. I would say that what we need is a real determination to make best use of the future CAP flexibility when they draw up. I think the strategy plan. And let's be clear. I think for us, this extra flexibility should not be about. I think doing basically what is being done right now under a different wording. I think this um, additional flexibility should be do about doing things better than in the past and in order to maximize the environment the economic and the social benefit i think from the policy and also maximize i think the capacity of using this policy in order to address tensions but also trade off in a much more effective way effective way than it is currently done from the com from the commission i think it's fair to say that it's fair to expect that solid technical support from uh, for the member states when they draw up, I think, the strategic plan. And this is already what we have been doing for the last uh, few months. And we have entered into a very uh, intensive phase, I think, of discussion with the member states into what we call, I think, this uh, structured dialogue. And then when it comes, I think, to the formal scrutiny of the draft that will be submitted by the end of the year, we need to take a rigorous but balanced approach between, I think, the strategic overview that we need to have because we are talking about strategy plan. And here again, I would like to underline because this is a big change, maybe the biggest change, the strategic approach between, I think, the strategic overview and the necessary examination of some of the detailed national policy decisions because we all know, in particular for biodiversity and environment, that sometimes I think the devil is in the detail. And I think besides member states and the commission, the civil society, including the scientific community, and there, I would like to stress that your help is still very much needed in feeding evidence, feeding ideas, I think, to member states, but also to the Commission. And I've seen that Maria was very attentive about, you know, Alan, uh, Alan analysis, and not only for now, clearly, but also for later, when we will consider you know, how well the plants are working on the ground, and if there's a need, I think, to adapt, I think, this, uh, this uh, plan and this national policy decision in order to best achieve, I think, the overall objective, and in particular, the biodiversity objective, which has been set. So to conclude in this ongoing process, the Commission does believe that when there's a will, I think there's a way. And if we work together in good faith and with a positive attitude, we do believe that I think we have a real chance of turning the tide more quickly than we have managed in the past, I think let's be clear in terms of pressure on farmland biodiversity. But I will extend, I think, this conclusion also to address climate change challenge because biodiversity loss and climate change are really, I think, the two biggest environmental challenges I think, of our time. So I'm sure that the papers presented this afternoon and all the background work, I think, that you know, I've gone into them, will make a, sub a substantial contribution, I think, to this, uh, to this work from the member states, I think, from the commission, but also for the performance, I think, of the future CAP. So I would like to thank you very much, I think, to all of you for all this contribution. Thank you. Sebastian, thank you very much also for shedding some light on what's next and also for like giving the perspective that some of the results may be even picked up immediately in the uh, following process. Thank you very much. And with this, I thank you. I thank for the opening words, um, Professor Teutsch and Commissioner Wojciechowski very much for opening this. Um, I would like to thank wholeheartedly the speakers to present a very dense and rich content in a very short time. Of course, I would like to thank the panelists and those who provided the very interesting questions to the panelists.
Last but not least, um, behind the scenes, we had um, Judith Rakowski and Jenny Schmidt helping us, um, also some Maren, um, and of course, uh, Guy Pear helped a lot in bringing this together, Sebastian Lagner, um, to yeah, help us organizing this. And last but not least, I would like to thank the audience for staying with, with us for all this time. I know it was a long and dense afternoon, but um, yeah, I hope we made it worth it. And before I'm closing the event, I would like to briefly hand over to Guy Pear for some technical issues. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to remind everybody that the report is now available online <clears throat> and it divides into three different volumes. One of them is a synthesis report where we took all the results that are relevant for the EU level. Then there are all the reports from the member states. Please do help us in making sure that they are reaching the member states because we are hoping to see a structured dialogue which continues beyond this moment, of course. Uh, and then there's, of course, a policy brief, which is not that brief. In fact, it's about 30 pages, uh, but we tried to be brief in, in delivering the main messages, which are hopefully useful uh, for a range of people. Um, so we are looking forward to continue this uh, situation and the, the dialogue. Uh, it was very exciting to have this uh, situation. I want to remind everybody that this was done voluntarily by, by all participants. Um, I'd like to particularly thank uh, Maren Berkenstock for having coordinated this amazing uh, process and, and this work. It would have not happened without her and uh, the help of Tunin Institute, especially also Norbert Röder uh, in reviewing and preparing this, which is published now uh, as a working paper under Tunin Institute. Uh, Sebastian Lackner is one of the authors and I need to thank the funding by IDIV and uh, DFG basically for my own project. This is ICAPES, Impact of the Common Agricultural Policy on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services and People. This entire uh, event was recorded and will be placed uh, online in the coming days so that it's available for people to watch it also if they haven't attended this event. So I would like to also thank the Commission for allowing us uh, to take the recordings of this event. And thank you everybody for participating. All right. Thank you, Jenny, for organizing and coordinating and moderating. Thank you. And I think with this, we can close the session. Thank you so much for all your efforts and have a good afternoon.